Grenfell Fire claimed 72 lives. The tragedy exposed critical failures in building safety and fire regulations. But it wasn't just fire safety issue. The disaster highlighted deeper problems in the industry. Flawed design processes, lack of competence and accountability. And this is not just a UK problem. Let's discuss the Building Safety Act, why it was introduced and what it means for the industry. The Grenfell inquiry revealed that the combustible cladding and poor compartmentation caused the fire to spread so rapidly. Building regulations were updated, banning combustible materials in the external walls of buildings over 80 meters. The government also initiated a recladding program for buildings that don't meet the new fire safety standards. As buildings were reclad, a bigger issue emerged, a widespread non-compliance unrelated to fire safety. No robust legal framework existed to hold anyone accountable for the non-compliant design and poor workmanship. Building regulations were amended for the fire safety, but the design and construction processes remained flawed. The same people who built unsafe buildings were now recladding them, with no checks of their competence or methods. In some cases, the buildings had to be reclad twice due to poor workmanship. Some buildings were so poorly constructed that the recladding alone couldn't fix all the issues, including structural problems. Other issues like mold and leaks surfaced, showing that many buildings failed to meet other building regulations, not just structure and fire safety. A shortage of skilled labor and designers meant recladding often done by the same installers responsible for original work. The Building Safety Act was introduced to address how the buildings are designed and constructed with a focus on competence. The Act enforces stricter processes for designing and building high-risk buildings, or HRBs, those over 18 meters or with at least seven stories and two residential units. The Act's gateway system prioritizes safety at every stage by introducing critical checkpoints, or gateways. At Gateway 1 planning stage, for HRBs, a fire statement is mandatory from the start. At Gateway 2, a detailed safety assessment of the building design before construction begins. Construction works cannot start without an approved design. At Gateway 3, the building safety regulator must approve the building before residents can move in. Traditionally, design and construction phases overlapped. That has allowed designers and contractors to commence the works on site without fully resolved details. Sometimes only with architects' drawings, where elements of facades were drawn indicatively, the systems were not necessarily specified, only loose performance specification would be stated, and the architects would commonly denote various elements of the drawings to be resolved by the specialist contractor at later stage. Works could start on site with architects' drawings showing 200mm masonry support bracket happily coexisting with 120mm cavity closer on 250mm thick slab. And prior to the Building Safety Act, construction often started on site before facade specialist contractor appointment for them to have no chance to resolve these details. Not anymore. Gateway 2 requires that all safety-related designs are finalized and approved before construction begins. This change effectively ends the design and build model for HRBs. And the industry now moves towards the design then build model. After the Grenfell disaster, the industry scrambled to find out how many other buildings were at risk. It became clear that up-to-date information on how these buildings were constructed was often missing. Even worse, inspections revealed that the documentation, like as built drawings and materials data sheets, didn't match what was actually installed. Cavity barriers were shown in the drawings but weren't installed, or non-combustible materials were specified but replaced with cheaper, inferior products. To tackle this, the golden thread of information was introduced. The golden thread is a digital record maintained throughout the building's life cycle. It contains essential safety information updated throughout the design, construction, and maintenance phases, ensuring that everyone has access to the most current safety data. We will cover the documentation needed for the facade design in the future videos, so make sure to subscribe. Competence declaration from those who design and build may also be required. Let's dive into what that means. A key aspect of the Building Safety Act is a focus on competence. This applies not only to high-risk buildings or HRBs, but to all buildings. Anyone involved in design, construction, or managing of a building must prove their, their competence in their current role. The Act requires that 
all industry professionals, whether working on high-rise residential buildings or lower-risk properties, must demonstrate they have the right skills, knowledge, experience, and behaviors to perform their role safely. This poses a challenge for the facade industry. Many professionals can demonstrate experience that might not be enough. For example, a person with 35 years of experience may be able to demonstrate 10 years experience of installing single glazed and neon glasses, or 10 years of experience of installing spray asbestos insulation. Yes, asbestos was fully banned in the UK only 25 years ago. And of course, most can demonstrate 20 plus years of experience installing combustible cladding and insulation in high rises as it was only properly banned in 2018. Experience alone isn't enough. Skills and knowledge are just as crucial. Industry professionals must demonstrate their competence through relevant qualifications. This requirement applies to all designers, construction workers, and managers, no matter the size of the building. It is not just about higher risk buildings. For instance, a project manager experienced in masonry facades might not be a right fit to oversee an installation of high rise glass curtain wall. Similarly, uh, an architect trained to create concept designs may not be qualified to produce detailed interface drawings for rain screen cladding or fire compartmentation drawings. The biggest challenge for the facade industry is that many professionals lack any qualification whatsoever, left alone qualifications relevant to their role and trade. They are often rely solely on the experience to prove competence, which is no longer sufficient. Various industry groups were established to develop frameworks for determining appropriate levels of competence and how to demonstrate them. For instance, the Joint Competence Initiative, or JCI, was created specifically for the facade industry professionals, tasked with defining competency levels and the methods to prove them. At IST, we are proud to collaborate with JCI in developing the baseline competency assessment. This tool is designed to help facade professionals demonstrate their prior learning. In future videos, we will discuss the assessment and different levels of competency and how JCI defines them. In close collaboration with JQA, a JCI member, IST has developed a qualification in facade design and engineering. You can learn more about it on our website. When it comes to behaviors, it is more complex. Demonstrating the track record of appropriate behaviors isn't always straightforward. Some understand that appropriate behavior means rejecting the work or design that you know aren't compliant and not taking on the tasks that you, are not, you can't prove your competence even if you think you are qualified. The Building Safety Act underscores accountability to ensure building safety is upheld throughout its lifetime. A new building safety regulator established within the Health and Safety Executive, or HSC, oversees the high-risk buildings. This regulator ensures compliance, conducts inspections, and enforces penalties for violations. Each high-risk building has a, an accountable person, usually an owner or a management company, legally responsible for the building's safety and its occupants. They must also engage with residents, addressing safety concerns and keeping them informed. The Act stresses that everyone in building process, contractors, suppliers and subcontractors, has a duty to ensure safety. The HSC can hold anyone in the supply chain accountable. They can also require anyone in the supply chain to demonstrate their competence. This includes sales representative advising on materials, architects, design managers of main contractors, facade specialist contractors, quantity surveyors, fabricators, draftspersons, and all engineers working in, on the UK projects, even if they are based abroad. Anyone involved in the design or influencing it must prove their skills, knowledge, experience, and behaviors are appropriate for their role and the building type they are working on. The Building Safety Act not only imposes fines, but also introduces the possibility of imprisonment for serious safety violations. Individuals found guilty for non-compliance can face up to two years in prison. This could apply to various offenses, such as providing false or misleading information to the building safety regulator. For example, submitting a test certificate for a product that wasn't used as tested or substituting materials not listed in the approved design documentation. Preventing an inspection or failing to provide requested information can also can be considered as an obstruction, leading to criminal charges. Additionally, performing work without the necessary experience, qualifications or proof of competence could be a breach of the act, potentially resulting in criminal charges. 
However, through discussions with industry leaders, we've learned that the primary concern regarding the Building Safety Act is that the challenge of demonstrating the competence of everyone involved in the design process, including the entire supply chain. This inability to prove competence could result in the failure to gain approval from the building safety regulator, preventing building occupation and handover of the building to the client. No one wants to find themselves in this situation. And this concern is driving one of the most significant changes in the facade industry. In our next videos, we will cover the design documentation required for Gateway 2 for different types of facades. We'll also discuss how this impacts the overall building program and which projects needs to facade specialist and manufacturer's involvement at the pre-construction service agreement stage, or PCSA. We will also review Joint Competence Initiative white paper, exploring the different competence levels for facade professionals, what they mean and how to demonstrate them. So make sure to subscribe to our channel. And if you found this video useful, please give it a like and feel free to leave any questions or comments below.